Chinese computer. All right, thank you for coming to my talk on how to avoid buying a lemon. Uh, my name is Nicole Bausma. I am a building biologist and founded the building biology industry two decades ago as a result of noticing very strong correlations between many of my patients' illnesses in their homes, especially if they had asthma, allergies, and fatiguing syndrome. In this talk, I'd like to um, discuss how to avoid a lemon with the focus of mold. In fact, as I was writing this just before, I realized that there's so much content that we, that we know as building biologists on healthy homes and their impact on human health, um, that I really wanted to focus on uh, damp buildings and mold and what to look for in a pre-inspection audit so you don't end up buying a lemon that could have massive complications for you and your family's health. So this is part one in a series of talks that I'll be conducting on how to avoid a lemon when it comes to buying or renting a home with the focus of mold this time. And then I'm gonna be focusing on electromagnetic fields in a different talk and then air traffic related air pollutants, et cetera. And I could pretty much spend the next <laughs> every week for the next six weeks talking about how to avoid a lemon with each particular hazard. So I thought I'd start with the, the one that we see the most as building biologists, which is damp buildings and their incredibly devastating impact they have on human health. All right, as I mentioned, I'm a building biologist. I founded the building industry, building biology industry um, 20 years ago. And we spent a lot of time liaising with a lot of practitioners, tradies, electricians, roof um, plumbers, um, for example, hydro hydrologists, strange consultants, and um, integrative clinicians, and identify issues with the house and then have to refer them on. We're a bit like the GP for the home in so far as we go, yep, there's a problem and now you need to see these type of practitioners in order to be able to fix the problem. And it's often very complicated. And what I love about my industry is that it affects so many other industries. And that's really obvious by the type of um, persons that I attract to the course. I've had building construction lawyers, I've had Department of Infrastructure and Education who look after schools coming through our course, BHP, um, a lot of hygienists, a lot of restorers, remediators, electricians, plumbers, building biologists, of course, you wanna be trained into the industry, naturopaths, I've had doctors come through our courses, it's been, beautiful to watch but it just makes me realize that our home is such a is um can be problematic across multiple industries and it's the place where we spend most of our time and yet it's the one more likely to be ignored by clinicians uh, even though it can have the most devastating impacts I just want to state very clearly that I'm not a builder, I'm not a registered builder, I'm not a building surveyor, I cannot provide any advice in relation to building structure or legislation that the House complies to code or National Construction Code or any Australian standards. I'm not a waterproof mem um, consultant or waterproofer, so I just want to make that really clear that I'm not going to be giving you building advice. The focus of my talks will be on how the homes could be contributing to your health and how to look for a home that's less likely to have these hazards. Also, I'm not a pest controller. However, what we do find, especially when it comes to mould, that pests are very problematic in these homes, especially with termites. So there are some questions you've got to ask when it comes to um, the landlord or the person who's currently living in the house in order to identify whether this is going to be a lemon or not. So the place history is so important. Our job as building biologists is to identify if there are elephants in the house. And I can tell you right now, there are elephants in every single person's home, including mine. You know, when I did an ERMI um, of the dust in the living and the bedroom, it came up elevated, slightly elevated, and there were no signs of moisture. Visual inspection was clear. I couldn't smell anything when we first looked at um, wanting to rent this home that I'm in that we eventually bought. And um, until I got those ERMI results, it, it didn't come up. And the reality was we weren't getting sick. So there can be little elephants in the house that uh, potentially could cause problems, but they're not enough to cause adverse health effects. And there are 
other elephants in the house that are so big by the time the client opens the door I can smell the damp musty odor and I go oh my god this is the herd of elephants in this house so my job as a lecturer is to educate my building biologists what to look for to identify is this going to be a hazard that could cause adverse health effects in your client now, in, interesting, Hippocrates had stated many years ago in his book, written over 200 years ago on airs, waters and places, that to understand any disease, you've got to understand both the person and the place in which the disease occurs. And our modern way of saying this is, when we're, I'm talking at conferences, both in Australia and abroad, is genetics loads the gun, but the environment pulls this trigger. Now, in 2003, when the human genome was mapped, it was thought that, you know, insurance companies would be a gold mine for insurance companies because they'd go, yep, you've got this gene, so we're not going to insure you for these diseases because that's probably what you're going to get, just like in the movie Gattaca. But that did not happen. And in fact, what it did is that it escalated that our environments are a significant contributing factor to many of the chronic illnesses that doctors and health practitioners would see on an everyday basis, that far from your genes playing a role, listen, 10% of genes will result in Mendelian disorders, that it's these gene variants in combination with your lifestyle, your diet and where you live and work that has massive consequences in terms of your risk for various different disease types. And of course, we know that the, um, Aging is caused by low grade systemic inflammation and pretty much every chronic disease you see with from neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and, and um, dementia to chronic neurodevelopment disorders like autism and ADHD, there's degrees of inflammation. Inflammation is like all roads lead to Rome and from a medical perspective, that's low grade systemic, which means whole body inflammation. What happens over years is you have this hormesis effect. You're born with, you have um, beautiful antioxidant um, reactions to hazards that hit your body, whether it's trauma from playing basketball and rolling your ankle to, you know, infection, et cetera, that results in inflammation. And it all then results in this response by the body to create large amounts of antioxidants, catalase, glutathione, peroxidase, et cetera, in your cell. So the cell gets um, a dangerous response or a hazard, it results in inflammation and the cell responds by producing antioxidants. As you get older, this hormesis effect is imbalanced because the inflammation that you never produce enough antioxidants over the over as you get older, so that the inflammation eventually subtly takes over and that results in many of the chronic illnesses you'll see, you know, as I mentioned, heart disease, arthritis, um, neurodegenerative disorders, etc. So what we want to do is try and keep this in balance and trying to create as many antioxidants as possible and not be exposed to these hazards to keep as healthy as possible. You know, don't smoke cigarettes and do regular exercise, but not too much because that's going to overwhelm the antioxidant pathways as well. So what's interesting about this is we've known about this for many, many years, two decades, that low-grade systemic inflammation is a, a major contributing factor to ageing and, of course, most of the chronic diseases. But what's interesting is that most of these are environmentally related. So, you know, our food, where we're bringing over 20 tonnes of food through our gut over a 70-year period, um, microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, of course, chemicals, industrial pollutants, toxic metals in our food, but in our homes like lead paint, in our dental uh, history, for example, amalgams, um, wireless technologies, plasticizers in, in everyday products, especially food packaging, in our clothing, in our building materials. Um, and of course, severe stress can also result in this uh, production of oxidative stress, which can overwhelm the antioxidant pathways and lead to accelerated aging and accelerated development of chronic illnesses. So all of these environmental hazards actually result ultimately in this increase in oxidative stress. When it comes to our home, the key questions building biologists will ask is, when did your symptoms begin? How long have you actually been unwell? Like, can you pinpoint a time or a cause that may have triggered those symptoms or, or that illness. And how long have you lived in the house? Like how long have you actually lived in that particular home? 
and when did that renovation occur, for example. Many of the illnesses I see, especially with mould, often start after renovation. So the client may have lived there for three decades, but has only been sick with chronic fatigue for 15 years. And 15 years ago, as I'm taking the exposure history, I identify that there was a bathroom renovation that was conducted by a conventional builder that upon ripping the bathroom part, that there was hidden mold in the walls and that material was dragged through the house and potentially contaminate the entire house with fungal particulate. And that's when they got sick. And I've had many cases of that uh, from my own experience as a building biologist where the chronic fatigue symptoms developed, you know, weeks later and the, the kids got uh, tonsillitis that was reoccurring, et cetera. So um, these are the type of things we're looking for as building biologists to see if the house is contributing and or causing the symptoms that are experienced by these people. So when did the symptoms begin? And of course, when did you move into the house? Is it a really important questions. And of course, do they improve when they're away from the home? That's really key. Although, um, as I indicate on my Facebook page, most of the, um, like the last caravan park I went to, the split system was contaminated. You know, in 2019, when I was traveling a lot, um, you know, eight out of the 10 hotels I went into had contaminated split systems or, or mould in the hotel room. So, you know, you go from your house, which is water damage, to another place that's water damage and that's problematic. But my, a lot of people do find when they go on holidays that they are better. And that to a building biologist is a red flag that maybe we need to make sure that there's nothing in this house that could be contributing because the symptoms are coinciding with when they moved into the house or after the water event or after a renovation where they may have been exposed to various hazards. Without question, the most important question you ask when you're looking for a house is how old is the house? Because that alone will tell a building biologist what potential hazards exist in that home. And that's very, very important. So pre-1986, we have lead paint. Lead paint, I still believe, is one of the major um, significant health hazards that exist in our homes. If it was built prior to 86, um, there was different changes in legislation up until 1965 there could be up to 50% content of lead in the paint. So 50% lead content within the paint up to 1965, after which the government reduced it to 1%. And in 97, that was then reduced to 0.1%. So the problem was that the government allowed whatever stock was left of lead paint to continually be used after it was taken from 50% to 1%. So we still have this lag of decades potentially of lead paint still being used in our homes, despite the fact that they could no longer bring it into the country or manufacture it with lead paint. And of course, we now know um, a big problem, of course, is brass taps in terms of lead contamination. Last week, the government announced it's spending $2 billion on replacing brass taps because they may contain up to 6% lead. And of course, in 2017, the Perth Children's Hospital, the new Children's Hospital in Perth, spent a lot of money removing the brass taps because it was actually creating elevated levels of lead in the drinking water supply of the Children's Hospital, which is crazy because, of course, lead is a significant impact on children's IQ, learning and behavioural disorders. We know a significant proportion of illiterate um, prisoners um, have high levels of lead, and that's part of the reason why they're illiterate, but also it results in violent and aggressive behaviour. So lead is still a massive problem, and most of it, if you're going to be exposed, it's going to be in the house. Now, if you have a house built prior to um, 1986, doesn't mean it's necessarily a problem. My house was built in 82. I did check for lead. It wasn't in the paint. However, if it was in the paint, it's not going to be a hazard, a risk, unless it becomes a dust. So if you decide to renovate, then that potentially could be an issue. And that's why as a building biologist, we ask these questions and we'd say, if you're gonna renovate your house and you're gonna sand back that paint, make sure you get someone like the Australian Dust Removalist Association to come in and take the paint, contain that, that room, you know, set up, set up containment with air scrubbers and negative air machines and make sure that they actually, you know, HEPA vacuum that dust as it's peeling off. That, you know, uh, that's really, really important. So it doesn't become a dust and it's, it's removed uh, properly so it doesn't spread lead dust throughout the rest of the house so that's really important so lead paint in walls is fine providing it's not disturbed a bit like asbestos asbestos up until 1986 
uh, is problematic. And of course, but even though it can cause asbestosis, it can cause mesothelioma and can cause lung cancer, it's not going to be a risk to your health unless you disturb it and you inhale those fibers. Now I have asbestos cement sheet in the eaves under the, the roof section outside of the house. I don't have any problem with that. However, if I decide to do a renovation, then I'm gonna to have to get a licensed asbestos removalist to actually remove that adequately so it doesn't become friable and then come in the house and affect me and the kids. So these are the sort of things. Yes, there's a problem. Is it a risk? No, providing it's not disturbed. Um, the older the house, the more likely it's gonna have multiple sources of water damage. So that's something you've gotta be mindful of. Let, let's face it, who hasn't overflowed their bathroom or their laundry trough? I mean, I've got done it multiple times, you know, especially with having kids, et cetera. So, but I did dry it within 48 hours, which is the key thing that it's dried within two days. Dust mites, the older it is, the more that those carpets are gonna be archeological dig sites of the entire house. Now with forensic DNA sampling, PCR testing, we're now able to uh, look at the household dust and we'll know every living organism, every pet, every pest, every human, every plant that actually walked into that house through because every hour you're shedding between 14 and 37 million bacterial genome copies into the, e into the air. And that's your forensic DNA signature all over the place. Um, it also, the carpet contains the household dust, which is mainly your skin cells, and therefore lots of dust mite, and you've got potentially have asbestos fibres, lead dust, you're essentially going to have things like flame retardants and solvents and chemicals and fragrances and all those beautiful things that accumulate in carpets. So first thing I'd say if you've got allergies is if you've got an old home, you'll often find you walk in there and it looks clean. You can't see dust, but it smells dusty. That's because there are kilos and kilos and kilos and kilos of dust sitting in the carpet. And every time you walk on it, it becomes airborne and of course you breathe it in. So the first thing I did, because my daughter has dust mite allergies, is to remove all the carpet in the house um, because I don't want someone's past history all over my carpets every time I walk on them. Um, if it's pre-1986 solder and copper in, in plumbing, I'm gonna talk about water in a separate talk on how to avoid a lemon and think about drinking water and what contaminants are in it and water filtration systems. Post-1986, in the last three decades, significant changes have occurred which dramatically escalated our exposure to mould and dampness. First of those was a um, change from um, solid, you know, PVC sheeting, waterproof membranes to liquid based waterproof membranes. Those sheet membranes had a half life or service life of about 30 to 35 years. The waterproof membranes, the liquid based, have a half life, uh, sorry, a service life of about seven years. Most people don't realize when they do a renovation, their bathroom's only designed to last the building warranty of seven years. What they should be asking when they're renovating is, um, I want you to get a proper waterproofer that's associated with a company that only does waterproofing and make sure that they do sheet-based membranes or if they use liquid-based membranes, they use a, a system like Gripset, which is probably the best waterproofing uh, product available, very good for people with toxicity and mold-related illnesses, and make sure they do it properly so that your bathroom lasts 30 years, not seven years. If people spend an extra $1,000, $1,500 during a reno, their bathroom uh, service life would be so much longer. The other issue is removal is the change from flexible, from copper pipe to flexible braided water hoses, which is the number one cause of insurance claims for water events in Australia, accounting for around $320 million every year. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the talk. Um, the other thing is this push to create energy efficient homes. So a lot of the newer homes that are coming on the market are having condensation and mold issues within one or two years. Research conducted by Dr. Tim Law, who's an architectural research scientist, identified 40% of new builds by their first winter had condensation issues uh, in if they were in temperate climates like Melbourne and Tasmania, because they're so tight that there's not enough good passive ventilation and the vapour barriers, that metal foil sheet they put in the walls, um, was waterproof, which is not ideal. It needs to be um, to prevent liquid water moving through, but it should be intelligent to enable the water vapour to move through. So when it comes to new homes, it's really important to make sure those waterproof sheets are 
permeable to water vapour. Otherwise, what happens is that water vapour in the house goes through your plasterboard, hits an impermeable barrier, and then it condenses and creates hidden mould in the cavities. And that can happen within the first year or two of a new build. There's so much going on in terms of litigation um, at NCAT, VCAT and the Supreme Court in new builds because of this condensation because we're building plastic bags that can't breathe and don't allow water vapour to move through the building envelope. So I'm quite happy here in my 1982 home with my asbestos eaves, with passive ventilation, with, um, you know, I've got slits in the wall because for the airflow. Me, I'm happy with that. I don't like this whole new plastic bag style of homes we're creating because I'm seeing so many problems in them. Also, chemicals outgassing. It's taking so much longer for the chemicals in your furnishing, your carpets, your paints to outgas because your house is so tight, the passive ventilation is so poor that it's taking much, much longer for these chemicals to get out of the house where they get evaporated and they re keep reprinting into the gyp rock, into other things in the house. That's not good either. Okay, so that's just the age of the house. When it comes to where your house is, the first thing a building biologist will do is look at Google Maps and look at its proximity to things like power lines, tram lines, cell phone towers, traffic related air pollutants, um, coal seam gas exploration, wind turbines, pesticide drift from farms, turf farms, bowling greens, parks, um, golf courses, very problematic in terms of your exposure to pesticides. You know, one of the top naturopaths who's a colleague, a friend of mine, who's had been on organic diet for 20 years, who's very, runs a very busy clinic in Sydney. Um, she checked her blood levels for pesticides and they were off the chart. She lived one block away from a, a golf course. And I said, look, you can't get away from it. It's everywhere. It's not a coincidence that many of these golf superintendents have more than double the incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a form of cancer, because they're exposed to these toxic chemicals, which they're often spraying in the middle of the night so no one sees, to keep these greens as beautiful as possible. I mean, that comes at a cost. So this is why a, a big part of the work we do is before you buy the block of land, before you buy the house, we want to know its proximity to these potential hazards. And golf courses, parks where councils are constantly spraying, even schools where they're spraying a lot, is very problematic. So I will go through a lot of these in a different lecture because today what I want to focus on is how to avoid a lemon when it comes to buying a home that's water damaged. Um, in a different lecture, I'll talk about traffic-related air pollutants and chemicals, such as from golf courses, et cetera, and present the research on that. Um, in the interim, you can get a lot of that from my book, actually. So my book contains those and discusses the exposure zones associated with different um, uh, in proximity to your house. So you can look at that. All right. Interesting in terms of the field of GM medicine, which is what, I, with, with, with what I've been researching, is that there's a significant variation in the burden of disease across Australia, depending on where you live. Now, in asthma, there's a 41-fold variation. So where you live could have a 41 times, that's like, you know, huge, 41 times higher risk of asthma simply because you live in that area. And that area tends to be near traffic related air pollutants through coal trains, you know, that are shipping coal from the mine to the port, living near a port, for example, Melbourne or near Westgate Freeway, high levels of asthma. And the way they've looked at this is they can just look at the medication for different diseases and found, for example, um, that, you know, people with taking asthma like uh, medication would tend to go to the pharmacies in those areas that therefore there would be high risks for those types of illnesses. ADHD, there was a 75-fold variation depending on where you lived. And it wasn't a coincidence that they're often near areas where there's high air particulate. Alzheimer's disease, there's a 15-fold variation. And there's quite a lot of research now on farmers and cancers risk uh, because of their exposures to pesticides and Parkinson's especially. Parkinson's, there's often um, in Northwest Victoria, a study conducted four years ago showed high levels of um, increased Parkinson's incidence in farmers using pesticides. 
Pesticides is my number one problematic chemical because it's the one in the research that comes up with almost every disease. I think a big part of this is the fact that most pesticides are antibacterial, which essentially means they're anti-living, anti-human, <laughs> because you're more bacteria than you are human cells. It's not a coincidence that many of these pesticides are used in women's products um, as preservatives, in moisturisers, in makeup, and that's a big reason why I don't sloth all that sort of makeup crap and moisturisers, even sunscreen I don't even like wearing um, because of the preservatives in it, which can affect the skin microbiome, for example. Um, the cancer incidence is in different parts of Australia by the... Um, Oh, I might turn that off now, by the um, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare showed that, you know, things like prostate cancers were significantly high in inner regional areas, that the inner regional areas of Australia had higher incidences of breast cancer, kidney cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, non-Hodgkin lymphomas, compared to very remote communities where there's very low socioeconomic groups and, of course, Aboriginals. So, you know, this is an interesting finding. And these areas, as you can see, are these orange zones um, across Australia. So they're often where there's manufacturing, there's often um, farming in these communities where they have these high incidences of diseases um, yeah, in a regional areas. So being mindful where you live and proximity to things like air pollution is really, really important, especially, for example, the exposure zone for an open cut mine is 70 kilometres. If you live within 70 kilometres of an open cut mine, you will be exposed to toxic metals and high levels of different particulate matter, which increases your risk for cardiovascular disease, heart disease, heart attack, stroke, high blood pressure, and of course, um, asthma and respiratory tract uh, related disorders. Traffic related air pollution. If you live in a street where the cars are stopping and starting, for example, a school where there's a crossing or a traffic light, that alone is problematic because if your house is right next to a crossing, when a car accelerates, it emits more fossil fuels and combustion byproducts and noxious gases like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, um, than any other time during that acceleration process. So that's important that you're not living in an area where cars are stopping and starting all the time is very important. So living near a school um, where there's lots of cars stopping and starting at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, that's problematic. If you're a night shift worker and you're trying to, to go to sleep during the day and there's noise, that's another one. I haven't even mentioned noise, but noise can be problematic too. Pro close proximity to anywhere where they're spraying pesticides, you know, the exposure zone for pesticide spraying is at least 1.2 kilometres where they found detectable levels of pesticides in the household dust. So you don't want that, as I said, golf courses and living on a golf course, that's a, that's a worst case scenario. Um, if you're retiring and you love golf, fair enough, you've probably only got another 10, 15 years left, that's cool, <laughs> if you're happy with that. But, you know, if you've got kids, I would be concerned about it because you have to seal the entire house and have full-on air filters with carbon filters and HEPA filters to get rid of those chemicals which will be imprinting every surface of that house. So these are the things that we look at as a building biologist. Mining. There are lots of mines, hundreds and hundreds of mines. People don't realise that across Australia. Many of them are open cut mines. As I mentioned, the um, exposure zones are 70 kilometres from an open cut mine. Um, and they're often, wherever the mining is, there's often high levels of toxic metals in the dust. So you don't want that. And of course, we know a lot about Mount Eyes and Port Piri um, with the open cut mines and children with lead exposures and significant increase, decrease in IQ and learning and behavioural disorders. You know, if they're living in those towns, that's problematic because the exposure zone 70 Ks. So that's a problem. Knowing where the mines are and getting onto um, Geoscience Australia website is useful. And this is what building biologists are trained to do. Almost half of Australia's total land area, that's 385 million hectares, is used for agricultural purposes. Around 24% is dedicated to crops. So I want to know how downstream my client's house is relative to crop dusting, for example, because that can be problematic. Problematic, especially in rural areas where they're relying on tank water to drink, because that tank water will be exposed to the pesticide drift, which gets into the water supply, which means that has ramifications for the type of water filtration system I'd recommend my client. Now, I'm not gonna go into water today, but I will do it as part of this series on drinking water and, and filtration. 
So what I'd like to focus this talk on, believe it or not, I haven't got to where I was going to start, um, was mould and how to potentially recognise if mould is problematic in a house that you're inspecting, you're thinking about renting it or thinking about buying it, what are you going to look for? Now, there's actually been no formal studies on the prevalence of damp buildings in Australia, but we anticipate it's between about 30 and 50%, um, and that was the World Health Organisation's estimate. Dampness affects at least 24% of the Nordic countries, one in four in the Netherlands, about one in three in Canada and New Zealand, and at least 50% of the US housing stock. In Australia, it's essentially unknown, but we suspect it's you know, anywhere from a third to 50%. 40% of new builds are affected by condensation. So I've given you that research by Dr. Tim Law. Um, this is a big reason why buying a new house I'd be very cautious because of the condensation issue. So there's certain things you want to look at in that new house to see if it's at risk. And a big question that should be asked is, in terms of who built it, did they use intelligent wraps? Wraps that allow water vapour to move through the building envelope. Otherwise, it's going to be a problem. Mould, of course, we know it causes upper and lower respiratory tract infections. It's of all the um, causative, we know damp buildings in fact a better term is dampness we know dampness causes and exacerbates asthma and allergies that is well established in the scientific literature there's a lot on it in the last two decades and of course we also know that it increases risk for respiratory tract infections one of the first signs i'll look for or symptoms in clients is do you get colds and flus that keep coming back and they drag on for weeks, not just days, weeks and months. That's a key symptom to me that I'm going to have to look to see if there's mould or dampness in this home. So recurrent colds and flus that drag on for weeks and months and keep coming back. For kids, it's chronic tonsillitis. That's very common. A middle ear infections often happen in younger children and babies, for example. This doesn't necessarily mean it's mould, but these are what the symptoms that I look for that will make me want to search more closely to see if dampness is an issue. Eczema is also quite common, especially in younger children. Of course, eczema and skin disorders, the first thing we look at, especially as naturopaths, is food allergies, because that's the number one trigger. If it's not food allergies, then I'll often look for the environment, and mould can definitely cause these dermatitis-like reactions, especially in young people like infants. What is concerning is what's coming in the literature now is there's a handful of studies to show that pregnant women when in damp buildings end up giving birth to um, children with low birth weight <clears throat> and their gestation period is decreased. Now, all the pregnant women that I've interviewed as part of my work as a building biologist, all of them gave birth er much earlier on than the 40-week gestation, anywhere from 29 to 34 weeks. So they were early. And secondly, their kids all had asthma, allergies and food-related intoler intolerances and they had low birth weight. Now, it's interesting because to, it was even though Richard Dole published the first study on smoking and lung cancer in 1952, it took 50 years for the government to legislate to ban smoking in public places. And the, how it got across, because of the amazing propaganda by the tobacco industry, how it got across finally was that it impacted an unborn child and it caused low birth weight. Well, there's three studies now that indicate that dampness in a pregnant unborn fetus may actually cause low birth weight. So that's something to look for. And of course, that is concerning, but it's just sort of at the beginning of that research. And the other one, of course, is pneumonia. I can't tell you how many people I see who've been in damp environments who are hospitalized for pneumonia. That's really, really common and, and that's really concerning. Um, some patients, rather than getting these respiratory issues, they have a specific genotype which predisposes them to this chronic long-term fatiguing syndrome that's um, mass that has symptoms of brain fog and we call this a pre-alzheimic brain even though when you do an MRI they don't have Alzheimer's so that's a red flag to me that it's either mold or electromagnetic fields um, the brain fog is poor concentration poor memory missing words mid-sentence um, spacing out at times forgetful very common symptoms of mold related illnesses 
pain throughout the body. Um, sleep distort disturbances is very big. In fact, sleep disturbances is big in all the environmental sensitivities. They can't sleep at night. They start sleeping during the day. It mucks up the whole circadian rhythm, and it's a very vicious cycle. They'll often have food intolerances. And these people, when you go through the history, they could eat wheat in the past. They're not celiac, so you know it's not a genetic disorder, but now they're gluten intolerant. They can't have gluten. And the reason is we're suspecting is that not because it was the food originally, but because in a damp environment, they're inhaling these fungal particulate, which is setting up an inflammatory response, suppressing key neuropeptides in the brain, that's vasoactive intestinal polypeptide and, and melanocyte stimulating hormone. And as a result of this, it's affecting their melatonin levels. It's affecting their ability to keep infections at bay. And of course, that has huge downstream effects in terms of their health, resulting in you know, a reduction in endorphins, pain, sleep disturbances, infections in their nose, their gut, their vaginal floor, et cetera. It's like mold is uncontrolled infections throughout their body. And all of the byproducts of that end up clogging up the detoxification pathways and a particular pathway in phase two, liver detoxification, which is also the same pathway that all the catecholamines, your serotonin, your dopamine, your, your noradrenaline go through. So over time, they get anxiety, depression, and maybe even mold rage. And then they get chemically sensitive, like they can't, you know, pick up a book and then, you know, the ink makes them react. This is because the detoxification pathways are also involved. So it involves multiple organs, multiple systems, and it takes quite a bit of time with an adequate clinician who knows how to, to identify this illness and then eventually reduce their toxic load and provide the accurate um, treatment to address that. Uh, sensitive to light, chemicals and smells. Their myelin sheath is, is degrading um, and this is why many of them, I find quite a few are misdiagnosed with multiple sclerosis when I think personally this is um, often a, a damp environment. But look, we need more research to verify that. Okay, um, there's, I won't go into detail on this, but this is Shoemaker's um, diagnosis for chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is... Um, uh, how he diagnoses, you know, if it's a mold illness, so I'm going to detail. And this is the pathway. I'm excited by this pathway. I love it. It just gives me finally the answers that I wanted to know 30 years ago when I was working as a naturopath. All right. So mold in a house, how do you find it um, when you're doing a pre-inspection audit? Well, firstly, you need to understand that a water damaged building is a chemical stew of microbes, fungi, bacteria, and all their byproducts endotoxins, mycotoxins, etc. It also is an environment for things like house dust mite, pests and other things like that that thrive in a water damage environment. So there are multiple things going on in a water damage environment. And if you're doing a pre-inspection audit, the thing that you, it might be difficult because they're just painted. So you can't smell the mold and you may not always be able to see because they've done some renos. But there are things to look for to see if this house has an increased risk for um, moisture. The cause of mould is moisture. Fungi is not the problem because it's on every surface of you, your books, your house, on the planet of the earth. From the Arctic to the Antarctica, fungal particulars everywhere because they're nature's greatest decomposers. They're meant to be there. Mold is not the problem. It's already sitting on every surface it's meant to. In fact, it's part of your skin microbiome, a little bit, a little bit of part of your gut microbiome. I think it's less than 5%, but it's meant to be there. So killing mold is not the issue here. It's what's causing it to grow, and that is moisture. As soon as you have liquid moisture, uh, liquid water or water vapour, for more than 48 hours, microbes will proliferate. And that's the key to understanding a home that may be at risk for mold. So the first thing a building biologist is going to look at is the climate zone. Are you in a climate zone where there's sustained humidity and water vapour that is going to enable microbes to grow on your, in your household dust just by sitting there? Um, we're going to look at visible mold, damp odour, condensation issues, etc. So with the climate zone, the first thing we're looking at, well, where do you live? Now, if you live in warm temperate like Sydney, Central Coast, um, Brisbane, North Queensland, Darwin, Broome, you're in trouble because you're in an area that's significantly humid. 
which means it's more than 70% relative humidity for more than two days. Because after two days, that's when the microbes really proliferate when they're exposed to water vapor. So it doesn't have to be a flood event or a water event or a cyclone or storm to cause mold in your house. It could simply be that you're living in a humid environment because the microbes and the dust sitting on the surfaces in your carpet are going to be utilizing the moisture in the air to support growth. And when they grow, they're going to infiltrate what they're sitting on. They're going to release enzymes. They're going to release um, mycotoxins and endotoxins. Some of these chemicals are the most toxic chemicals known to man because they're trying to kill each other off and take over your house. And quite frankly, you're in the way. So the key to a healthy home is one that's dry, like a Mediterranean-like environment. It's not moist and it certainly doesn't have sustained water vapour. So if you live in Sydney, Central Coast and all these areas, the only way you're going to deal with that is to have permanent dehumidification and or heating. Because the art of psychrometry is that the warmer the air is, the more it holds moisture. So in winter, when it gets cooler, for example, in Sydney, you can't justify having the air conditioning on which is the perfect dehumidifier. Your air conditioner acts as a dehumidifier because it pulls moisture out of the air and therefore reduces the risk of mold growing. But when you turn the air conditioner off, the humidity levels go up. And if it's more than 70% for two days or more, all the microbes in your house are gonna start having a party. So the key when you're living in Sydney Central Coast in these areas is to have dehumidification or heating. So. In Sydney, of course, it gets cool in winter, so you want your heat, you want you, you turn the air conditioning off, but it may not be enough to justify the heater. Well, it's important. You have to have either a dehumidifier or a heater. Now, the way the way heater works is it holds more moisture in the air, so it lifts the moisture off the surfaces, and that can be a cheap way rather than a dehumidifier, just to prevent condensation happening in the house. We often find condensation happening in all the walk-in robes, et cetera, in Sydney, because the airflow is restricted. Those areas aren't heated, and that's just enough to hit dew point and condensation to happen. The only way you're going to prevent it is to either heat those rooms marginally to prevent it hitting dew point so it doesn't condense, or have a permanent whole house dehumidifier or dehumidifiers in various parts of the house. Now, if you're going to get a dehumidifier, get a hygrostat, which means that it's intelligent, that it will kick in if it's above 60% relative humidity and turn off if it's below 40%. When you go on holidays for a weekend or for a week or go to your European holiday, um, you need to have your dehumidifier or heater on because the cost of you not keeping that on living in Sydney means coming back to a mold box and there's simply no way around it. That's the cost of living in those environments is you have to dehumidify and or heat to prevent it hitting, con causing condensation and allowing the microbes to grow because they will. So that's the cost of living in those environments. You have to dehumidify, even when you're on holidays, keep the air conditioner on or do something. Otherwise, you're going to come back home and then you'll, instead of, you know, just dealing with some condensation, now you're up for a $20,000 mold remediation job. So that's the first thing. The second thing, stormwater system. You want to make sure that the house can cope with heavy rains. Now, a lot of the homes that I deal with in... Um, assessment are a disaster, like a flat roof. Don't buy a house with a flat roof. <laughs> they nearly always leak. Um, don't buy a house that has a butterfly roof where people don't clean the gutters and then it ends up caving in and it's just, that's the weak point. If you can't see the gutters when you buy the house, that's a problem because it doesn't remind you to clean the gutters. And I'm here to tell you, just like your body that needs to service and tune, so does your house. You can't get away with not maintaining your house. A lot of the problems we find as a building biologist is that the occupants just don't maintain the house. They don't clean the gutters every season, which they should. I clean mine every six weeks because I live in a vegetated area. I have to. I'd rather live in that area and clean it every six weeks than not live in this area and live in the city. So, you know, you need to think about the maintenance involved to ensure that it's not going to be a health risk. So in terms of roofs, in my book, there's a list of roofs, problematic roof constructions that are often contribute to, um, you know, increased risk of mould. In fact, I have that. I don't know if you're going to be able to see that. But if you have a look there, there's some roof constructions. You can see this is from Tim Law's research, like this here. Um, you know, flat roofs or butterfly roofs can be very problematic um, insofar as increased risk for, you know, the sun hits one roof, it gets hot, doesn't hit the other side, which is shaded, so that has more condensation issues, etc. 
So look at the roof and get a binocular. There's two things I want you to take to a pre-inspection audit is a torch to look at things thoroughly, subfloor, roof, etc., and binoculars. I always try to get to higher ground so I can see onto the roof of my client's house. Are there missing tiles? Is the flashing missing or rusting or corroded or, you know, whatever's poking out of the roof, that's the weak point. So I want to see close up with my binoculars. Is it problematic? Do they need a licensed roof technician to a jet to you know, in, in, inspect that and fix it because that's where the moisture is going to be coming in. The second thing is make sure there are downpipes every time the roof changes direction. I've never found a house with adequate amount of downpipes. It's not in the Australian standard. It's not in the National Construction Code. So the builders will build it and don't have to do it. But I can tell you now, if there's not a downpipe Every time the, room, the roof changes direction, you'll often get moisture getting into the roof void. So you need to make sure there's enough downpipes and they're properly connected. Half the time, they're not even connected and they're just putting moisture down into the subfloor. That's a problem. So downpipes. You can see in this picture, this is completely inadequate. There should be a downpipe on this part. There should be on this these ends of the roof here as well. Because you've got to think about in a heavy rainfall, will this house divert water away from the home? That's really important. The other thing is, is a land. Make sure it's on a flat block. If it's in a hill and you're not willing to spend $50,000, $60,000 on drainage, skip it. I can tell you most of these houses are typical that we go to as building biologists. They're a flat roof. They're on a hill, in a hill, at the bottom of a hill. The gutters, the downpipes aren't enough. The gutters are in bad shape and the house is just a disaster. So, you know, on a hill, big problematic unless they've got very, very good drainage. Think about if you're on a hill, how the water's getting to the house. Is there enough pipe, enough um, drainage to divert that water away from the house so it doesn't get into the subfloor or into the home? And that's just a simple visual inspection. So, you know, as I said, the typical house for us is, you know, on a hill, flat roof, not enough downpipes, all of that sort of stuff. Gutters can't see, box gutters, they're a disaster because you can't see them. I want to see the gutters. I want to see the leaf litter in it so I can remind the clients to actually clean the gutters is very, very important. So these are the sort of things you're thinking about, building biologists will think about when they're doing an inspection is will it cope with a heavy rain pour and divert it away from the house. Other things like built-in balconies. When I see a balcony built into the house and there's a, floor, and there's a room underneath it, Big problem because those waterproof membranes aren't designed to last more than 20 years, the exterior ones. So it's going to leak at some point and it's going to require a major renovation to deal with it if it hasn't already contaminated the whole house with mould. So things like that I wouldn't buy. Visible mould, do a very thorough inspection and do it with your torch. So use a torch when you're looking throughout the house, especially in the walk-in room. <laughs> Just check the clothes. The south side, the south side of every home, especially Melbourne, Sydney, is the coldest part of the house because that's where the sun doesn't get much exposure to that part of the house. So that's where you carefully look behind pictures, behind curtains. You know, if you're sensitive to asthma allergies, don't wobble the curtains because you're going to get a lung full of fungal particulate. The way I um, investigate, inspect curtains is I go onto the outside and I look through the window onto the curtains because that's often where the mould is with my torch to see, mm, that doesn't look good. So, you know, behind curtains, but especially on the south side of the house, because that's where most condensation happens, because it's the coolest part of the house. All the water vapour from the home hits the cooler surface, condenses, and that's why you get spots of visible mould. If you have visible mould around a window and around the walls in an older home, it's often because there's no insulation and because it's single pane windows in a metal frame. That's just a localised problem. It may not necessarily be a problem in terms of health effects, unless you're cleaning it and you're sensitive. And the reason that is a problem is because basically when it gets cold outside, the outside of the house becomes the similar temperature to outside. And when all that water vapour from you breathing, cooking, bathing, hits that cold surface, the plasterboard on the south wall of the house, it's cold, which means it hits dew point and condenses. So you see water droplets there, you see visible mould patches, and it's a localised issue simply because they don't have insulation and they often have single pane windows. How do you fix it? You pull all the gyp rock off and you insulate and you replace the windows and there's no other way to fix that. So just be mindful about that in an old house. And if that's in the house, there's also going to be lead paint and asbestos. So just be mindful about that. If you want to renovate, you should get ADRA, the Australian Dust Removers Association, 
litigation involved and it's going to cost thousands to do it. So is it worth buying that? You need to question it, especially if you have kids, I'd say give it a miss if you want to get pregnant. Look for signs of visible mold. Now, this is the underlay of the carpet. The only way you're ever going to pull that up is with a full face respirator. Now, if you're ever cleaning mold or you're starting to do a thorough inspection, you must wear a full face because most of that fungal particulate is going to come through your nose and mouth and your eyes. You must protect the eyes. There's not one builder, restore or remediator who comes through my mold course who actually has even got a mask like this. And you wonder why this industry, they're so unwell. It's important to cover the eyes. So when you're cleaning, high levels, large surfaces of visible mold, you must have a full face respirator on or don't do it, just leave it. Um, get someone else to do it who does have that equipment. So this is this white efflorescence is moisture. Um, and when we uh, sampled that, that was high levels of aspergillus penicillium. With this bed slat here under the bed, I always look under the beds, always. Um, you have this mold here and you can often only see it when you've got a torch shining on it. Now, I'll put this as its own slide. This is one of the most important markers. If there's any damp or musty odour, that's a big, big red flag. And the reason is because it means that there's microbial growth happening in the house. Um, odour only happens when there's microbial volatile organic compounds or VOCs. They are fungi farts, which means they're gases produced by microbes. You only smell them when microbes are growing. So if there's a damp, musty odour, that's a big red flag and all building biologists will ask you this before they inspect your house. Are you aware of any damp, musty odours? Where are they? Because then we might need more PPE and just be cautious that we need to find where that moisture is coming from that's supporting that growth. So that's visible mould and damp, musty odour, big red flags. Um, visible mould, I'm not talking about a little bit of mould in the grout. I mean, that may not be an issue, or it could be. Without testing, it's hard to say, and that's where thermal imaging or testing can be useful. But look, the older the house is, the more you're going to have a little bit of mould in the shower. Um, as I said, sometimes it's just a local bit of mould. It's not going to cause health effects unless it's growing in the walls. With visible mould, by the time you see it, you've got 65 million spores per square inch. So... By the time you see it's problematic, and if it's a little bit of mould, it's a little problem, and if it's a big bit of mould, it's a big problem. So the risk increases with the surface involved. The problem is if you see it on gyprock and plasterboard, it might be the titanic iceberg. So you see, you know, maybe that much mould on the gyprock, but inside the wall cavity could be five times more than that. You don't know until, and that's why we do wall sampling and thermal imaging and et cetera to identify how big the problem is. So if you see visible mold or odour in that house, that's a big day of red flags for me. Moisture and condensation. You might see condensation issues, and I see this a lot in new builds because they're so tight that they haven't accounted for the fact that water vapour cannot move through this building, <laughs> especially multi-storey apartments are a disaster at the moment. And as I said, a lot's going on in court as a result of these new builds. So if you're seeing condensation like that, that's a problem. And the way to see it, because they'll wipe it off before the inspection, is to get the torch. And instead of shining the torch at 90 degrees to the wall, shine it down the wall and look down the side of the wall where you can see that condensate. That would be a red flag for me. Um, there here you can see peeling paint, cement. These are all signs of moisture damage. Um, you can see here the delamination of um, the Particle board is splitting. That's a problem. Um, you can see here, oh, this picture here, let's go back, is a, a picture of an audit that we did. It's just a south-facing unit. Don't buy that. South-facing units, like there's no light. If you haven't got enough light in the house, ideally every room of the house should have enough light that you don't need to turn the lights on. If you don't, it's darker, it support, it means more moisture potentially. So for me, one of the first things I looked at when I got this house was how much light is in every part of the house because mould and microbes don't like light. And light means more solar radiation, which means more heat, which means less moisture. So that's really, really important. Here are signs too of staining. You've got uh, staining here in terms of the plaster, the paint's peeling. You've got moisture here on the particle board, yellow tongue. You've got here the um, bubbling of the paint because of the balcony above and you've got condensation on the window. So that's a big red flag. You've got water staining. Pardon, I'm just gonna let the kids in just a tick. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so you can see here the bubbling of the paint, etc. That's a sign that there's water condensation. And look, one way to do this, thermal imaging, you can get thermal imaging apps. If you can afford it, it's well worth it because you can see things that you'd never get on a visual inspection. One of those is, you can see in this example, um, on visual inspection, you can't see any moisture ingression, but in thermal imaging, you can see water wicking up the walls. In terms of the bathroom, you can see here, you're looking at the bathroom and you can see the um, bottles, etc., and you don't see anything on the tiles. But in a thermal imaging camera, you can see this, this temperature change and you'd need to back it up with a moisture meter to see if it's moisture. In this case, it was. There was significant moisture in the wall cavity that was supporting microbial growth that you can't see on visual inspection. Sorry, Nicole. Sorry, do you, um, the app that you mentioned for the thermo imaging, do you recommend a specific type and is it worth investing in a moisture meter? Um, I believe you can get pin moisture meters for a couple of hundred dollars. The problem is, is you're putting holes in people's houses and they won't want that. Um, so yeah, look, you can, if you're building biologists, looking at building biology, absolutely. But you'd want to get the best equipment because you get what you pay for. But the problem with the, the cheap um, moisture meters is their pins. So you have to put holes in the client's wall to identify. They're not a scanning moisture meter. And that's the one that you want to do as a screening tool to see if there's moisture. So um, just be mindful about that. And look, the more expensive, the more less it takes time to acclimatise. But yeah, look, if you can get one and you can use it in pre-inspection audit, definitely. I certainly used it for my pre-inspection audit when we got the house. Yeah. Thermal imaging, um, they're so cheap now. Like, you know, I bought mine for three and a half thousand five years ago. Now the apps that you can attach the um, thing to an iPhone is under a grand and it's more effective, more accurate <laughs> than the one I bought, you know, five years ago. So but I mean, who's going to spend $1,000, $900 on thermal imaging just for pre-inspection unless you're doing the industry, you're in the industry, it's your call. Um, you can see here efflorescence. So in the subfloor, I'm looking at the subfloor for signs of moisture and I do not want to see this. This is salts because of moisture on the subfloor. Uh, you can also see there's some visible mould here and that is very problematic because the this, this, more shallow the subfloor, the more likely it's going to wick up into the building and so is the fungal particulate, especially if it's floorboards. So the problem is I want to see a subfloor, if you have a subfloor, that means just the space under the, on the, under the house, it's dirt and it has piers and stumps. That's what I'm talking about for those who are not familiar with the subfloor. Um, it needs to be dry. The whole thing needs to be dry. If that's not dry, I'd walk away on that alone. Like when I was looking for, you know, to rent a house, et cetera, it's the first thing. <laughs> Everyone walked into the house who was inspecting the house. There were 10 people looking for this house. It was years, 15 years ago when renting was crazy in Melbourne. And the first thing I did is forget the house. I actually want to look in the subfloor because if that's wet, that's not even going to be an issue. I'm not even going to look inside the house. Um, and that's because a normal uh, subfloor that's dry you know, a 100 square metre house, for example, will wick, you know, at least 45 litres of water vapour will come off a dry subfloor every day. If there's moisture onto that subfloor, then that will actually increase it by fourfold. There'll be 180 litres wicking off that subfloor into potentially wicking into the building. So that is very, very problematic. Um, and that alone to me, I wouldn't even look at that house if, if I saw anything like that in the subfloor. You know, things like duct work, et cetera, on the floor. Well, just make sure there's no moisture like there was here. The rubble under the house. You'd be amazed what people put under a house. You know, um, ducted heating vents, et cetera. You know, all these things. So, you know, I want to look under the house. You know, when I'm looking at a house, I don't want to see things like, um, uh, let's go back. you know, leaf litter close to the house. I don't want to see garden beds budding up to the house. I want to see as many vents around the house that the subfloor can breathe as much as possible. If you've got a large, a high subfloor, that's great. More passive ventilation, that's great. But of course, it's more expensive to build a house with, with larger piers, higher piers. But it's ideal. If you're building, you definitely want something with, you know, to have good subfloor ventilation. That's why those Queenslanders are so good. You can walk underneath them. They're made from timber, which is hygroscopic and absorb and release the moisture from the humidity. They have a big hat. So hats, 
I want to see a house that has eaves. If it hasn't got eaves, I wouldn't buy it because it's not protecting the house from wind-driven rain, and that's often why the render cracks so quick. So, and also moisture penetrates in the wall and can get in in hidden. So you need eaves on a house. A house should always have a good hat. Um, very, very important. But of course, that's they're building them so cheap nowadays. There's no eaves, there's no subfloor, blah, blah, blah. And you know, this is why we're in the mess that we're in. Roof. Now, I don't ex expect or anticipate you're going to stick your head in the roof, but I mean, I do as a building biologist. I don't go into the roof, but with my full face respirator they just showed, I'd get on a ladder, get into the manhole and just look into the roof. How much dust is there? If it's pre-1986, I'm going, it's probably going to be a bit of lead, synthetic mineral fibres, maybe even asbestos fibres. I want to see if there's pest activity um, because pests will be where the moisture is. Is there any visible mould with my torch? So I'll often what I'll do is I'll just get in the subfloor, just put my head in with a full face respirator and take heaps and heaps of pictures and then get down into the house and then look on my camera. Can I see pests? Can I see mould? Can I see, you know, what's the insulation like? Is it half missing? All that sort of stuff. So I do like to stick my head in there. Is there sarking um, to protect the roof? Is there missing tiles? Can I see light poking through? You know, just by putting my head in the manhole, I would do that. Um, but obviously, you know, you need a ladder, you need a full face respirator and a good torch and a camera. Flexible braided water hoses, number one cause of water events in Australia. These are a disaster and they need to be replaced every five years. So I check under each sink. For delamination, you saw the particle board starts to swell, any swelling, any staining, any pest activity, um, any corroding of these um, steel braid. I want to look under the sink, especially under the kitchen sink, the laundry sink and the bathroom sink, because that's where water can be hidden. Um, so open up the covers, move stuff around and have a look at the back. Is it swelling, anything like that to show signs of water um, penetration? Now, one of the useful things, it's as building biologists, we don't generally do ERMI, the Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. It's a test of where you take um, some dust from the living space, you vacuum, you know, 1.2 metres living space and a bedroom, and then you send the dust cassette, which looks like this, to the lab, and then they do DNA testing to see what type of moulds are present. Um, and it's a, it's a good screening tool to identify how mouldy the house is versus a relatively healthy home. The only problem is it doesn't tell you what where the moisture is. It doesn't tell you the boundary of fungal particulate spread. So you can't do any remediation based on these results, but it gives you an idea of how mouldy the house could be. It's $400, but I think if you're going to rent or buy, I think this is a really important test. As I said, as building biologists, we don't use it because it doesn't give us the information we need to remediate the house. It just says, yes, this is how mouldy your house is, and these are the type of fungi and species present in the house. So that's all it does. But I think it has a place as a screening tool for pre-inspection audits. Okay, so case study here, the balcony has positive fall. So when it rains, the rain's going towards the house. There's water staining. You can see here plaster uh, board is starting to lift up. You could actually poke your hole through many of these walls. The paint was peeling this visible mould under the new carpet. So I just get a windscreen carpet pick or a you've got a, what we call a carpet or AW, which is like a little hook. It looks like a screwdriver. I mean, take it with a hook at the end and I just pick up the sides, the corners of the carpet with my full face respirator on and I peel it back and have a look at the smooth edge, um, which we saw a picture of before. And if that's black and if it's not timber, then I, I, I know there's significant mould. But of course, that means you have to quickly stomp it back on. And I think the real estate agent or the client who owns the house would have a heart attack if they saw you starting to peel the carpets back. But I mean, I, I could put it back and no one would know. However, and I think that's a really important part of the inspection because I want to see if it's new carpet, if it's hiding something underneath. So that's what I'm looking for. In this house, the results were absolutely shocking. You know, we had over 100,000 Aspergillus penicillium in the house, in the master bedroom air sample, like that was a disaster. And basically they, you know, there was condensation on the walls. When it rains, it drips onto their bed. I mean, it was just really problematic. So, and they did a renovation and the builder came and opened up a whole wall of visible mold and contaminated the whole house. I mean, what can I say? It's just a disaster. So who's susceptible? Anyone with allergies is susceptible and asthma. Anyone who 
um, has brain fog, is likely to be susceptible. Anyone with metal related illnesses or metal in their body increased risk, especially for electromagnetic field exposures. Um, but also most metals are antibacterial. So that's why they affect the microbiome. And of course, the age and timing of exposure. Children are going to be vulnerable. The unborn fetus is going to be vulnerable, all of these things. Um, and of course, the canaries in the mine are increasing. Professor Ann Steinemann's research has shown one in three Australians react adversely to fragrances and chemicals and get headaches from that. So it's getting worse because our toxic load is just skyrocketed enormously because of changes in farming practices, chemicals in our building materials, in our personal care products, etc. Okay, um, I won't go into that because we're sort of getting out of time. So for more information in terms of doing a pre-inspection audit, you can go through the Australasian Society of Building Biologists. There are a list of building biologists in various states who can assist you in terms of pre-inspection audit or once you've decided you bought the house that you want to um, you know, get a more thorough inspection to see what's going on. The Australian, of course, the Australian College of Environmental Studies is my college and we run nationally accredited training in mould testing um, and also building biology, feng shui and electromagnetic field testing. So just to summarise, you want to know the age of the home because that's going to tell you quite a few red flags, which I document in my book, Healthy Home, Healthy Family, and the exposure zones are there as well. Um, you want to identify any signs of condensation, visible mould, damp, musty odour. You want to see that there's good, the subfloor is dry and no signs of efflorescence, the salt or any wetness on the soil. You want to make sure the vents in the subfloor are open and allow air to flow. You want to make sure... Um, that there's no condensation inside the house. You're going to look under the troughs, the kitchen, laundry and bathroom to see there's no uh, swelling of the particle board as signs of past moisture. You're going to look for signs of pest activity and frass, which is like cockroach parts and ants, like they have these little brown, looks like a little bit like uh, coffee grounds that can be signs of ants activity because pests come in when there's shelter, food and moisture. Moisture is the key, so signs of pests. You're always going to ask about termites because where the termites are, that's where the moisture is. So we get quite a few pest controllers coming through our mould testing course because they're great at finding the moisture because that's where the termites are. So asking, is there a history of termites? Where were they in the house and getting a closer inspection? And of course, if you find anything, get the building biologist to come in and do moisture mapping with their moisture meter and thermal imaging to identify you know, how the extent of the issue whether it's fixable or whether you should just pass it on and keep looking. For more information, as I mentioned my book, um, my personal website, buildingbiology.com.au, has a lot of videos and other things like that. I also have a newsletter, which I <laughs> very rarely write, but should uh, probably two or three times a year. I will get onto it once I finish the PhD, which will happen soon. Um, and my Facebook page, I often, you know, put stuff up there from the newspapers or what's topical at the moment to just get people mindful about what's going on in their homes. All right, so that's it from me. Questions, let's have a look what's going on in the chat. Oh, 40 chats, geez. <laughs> Great. I'm just going to stop the recording.